Okay, this video is about um, ion exchange and hard water, and it covers the material in section 4.8 of your textbook. So what is hard water? You hear something about that occasionally. Some of you might even, um, at your homes, have water softeners that are uh, designed to address this problem down in your basement somewhere at home. Anyway, so what is hard water? Well, hard water, by definition, is just something that contains higher concentrations of these ions, calcium 2 plus and magnesium. So calcium 2 plus and magnesium get formed when water underground passes over certain kinds of geologic structures that are rich in um, limestone, and dolomite, which have high concentrations of calcium carbonate and magnesium carbonate. So under the right conditions, some of those ions can dissolve, along with the carbonates and other um, anions to keep charge balance, into the water. And so particularly if you have well water, you end up having water that has pretty high concentrations of these ions. Well, that wouldn't be such a problem, you would think. Uh, but sometimes these ions can affect the taste of the water. A few of them in water actually give water a little bit of sharpness or crispness. But too much in it can kind of affect the taste. But more importantly is that these ions can combine with anions from soap. So you may not know that soap has anions in it. So soaps are made of kind of fats that have been modified. And the fat part is what dissolves dirt and oil and soap and those sorts of things. But there's an anion part attached to those molecules. And those anions then combine with these calcium and magnesium anions uh, cations, and what do they do? Well, they precipitate out. And that precipitate is kind of this fat, greasy, yucky stuff that you may have seen on the uh, ring around your bathtub. It's soap scum. And soap scum in your clothes, if you wash clothes in hard water, well, you'll precipitate out your detergents, and your clothes will end up looking gray and a little bit nasty. So, you know, this is undesirable stuff to have in your water supply. Worse yet is that these guys can continue to combine with carbonates now, again, just like sort of where they came from, in water. And then they can form insoluble carbonates. And so they precipitate out again. And this precipitation is known as scale. And scale uh, builds up on surfaces, particularly in boilers, water heaters, and in pipes. And um, it can actually encrust pipes so that the water no longer flows through them very well. They get narrower and narrow, narrower as this stuff precipitates. On water heaters, they prevent the ability of the heater to work very effectively because it's got to heat up this sort of ceramic stuff that's on the outside now, all this precipitated calcium and magnesium carbonate. And that stuff doesn't heat up very well. It doesn't transfer heat very effectively. And in particular, it'll happen in your coffee machines, which is why you have to clean them every so often. And well, those coffee drinkers among, among us, that makes us sad. Yes. So what do we do about hard water? Well, one way that we can address hard water is to do something called ion exchange. So ion exchange happens all the time naturally, but it's also a technology that we chemists have been able to develop and enhance and use to human purposes. So what is ion exchange? Well, you need some sort of material that has charges on its surface. So technologically, we can engineer these things. We can engineer what's called an ion exchange resin. And typically, it's some sort of plastic bead. The beads are typically a little bit larger than the size of a grain of sand. And on the outer surface of those beads, we've been able to chemically modify those with things called carboxylate groups. So attached to the surface, so I'll draw this little wiggly line to represent the surface of the bead. Then, and so this is all that plastic material sort of inside here. And then we've attached this carboxylate group. So that's a C attached to an oxygen with something that we'll learn is called a double bond. And then you have another O right here that has a negative charge attached to it. So that is a carboxylate. So a carboxylate group. And carboxylates show up on other structures too. So these are important parts of proteins and so forth. You'll see these groups on the surfaces of some proteins. But anyway, so what we do is we fill up a uh, water softener uh, device. So it's a big can, right, that sits in your basement. It'll be, you know, several feet tall and a few feet in diameter, you know, so it looks like this big tub. And we fill it with this resin. And each of these tiny little beads will then have a carboxylate with a negative charge. So remember, we always have charge balance in nature. You never see charges by themselves. So there's always something to counterbalance the charges. And in the case of water softeners, our counterbalancing charge is a sodium cation. So because plus likes minus, the sodium cation will feel a force of attraction to this negative and stay attached. 
And then as you begin to flow hard water through this system, so it kind of goes in through this pipe, down, percolates through all these beads, and out through a little filter that then comes up and then out to your house, soft water. Well, what happens is the uh, water that comes in with calcium and magnesium cations, well, they float in here, and it turns out that calcium and magnesium have a bit higher affinity for these carboxylates than the sodium cations do. So what they do is they'll go in and attach themselves to the carboxylates and displace the sodiums that were there. And then the sodiums get released, and sodium cations won't bind with things to precipitate. Remember our solubility rules, all sodium cations are soluble, so we're not going to make insoluble stuff. And so the sodium cations then flow out to your water source as soft water, and so we can use that in our homes now. But you'll sort of see a problem with this, right? As you keep using this, what's going to happen? Well, more and more calciums are going to come in here and bind the carboxylates, knocking off the sodiums. And eventually, all these sites, or at least many of them, will be occupied by calciums. What are we to do? Well, those of you that have these things in your basement know that periodically you have to go out and you have to buy this big bag of what is actually just sodium chloride. It says water softener on it, but it's just salt. It's just sodium chloride. And you take that sodium chloride and you add it to your water softener system. And then what you do is, and it makes a brine. Brine is just salt water. So you flow the salt water in. Then what happens? Well, the brine's coming in, and it's kind of going up through the bottom here, and it's going to get washed out. It's called backwash, so it goes in here and out this way. So you close one of these valves so it doesn't go to your house while you're doing this. And um, so, because you don't want to have lots of salt water coming out of your spigots suddenly. Anyway, so all that salt water comes in here, and because these concentrations are so high, there's a chance that these calciums will just naturally break off. Now, here in this case, um, the calciums would then reattach somewhere else. But now, because we've got such a high concentration of sodium, chances statistically are much higher that these sodiums are going to bump into these negative charges and stick there. And eventually, the calciums will get washed out. And so that's how you regenerate your ion exchange resin. So it turns out that there are many natural materials that are also good ion exchangers. They're natural minerals, certain components that you can read about in your textbook called zeolites. And even the surface of glass is a pretty good ion exchanger. So oftentimes if you have um, polyvalent cations, so these are cations with more than a plus one charge, so we call them polyvalent because they have more than one charge, um, those guys will stick fairly well to the surface of glass. So your glass may look clean, but in fact it probably has some of these ions attached to it. And that might be a problem with your glassware if you're going in to do an experiment where you care about having calcium or magnesium or iron or copper 2 plus or whatever attached to your glass that might wash off. And so chemists have to treat their glassware wear in a particular way if they want to avoid those kind of contamination issues. Um, ion exchange is also used in purifying water. So we can replace these sodiums instead with H pluses. And then there's a different kind of ion exchange resin called a uh, anion exchange resin made with something that has a positive charge. And you can attach OHs there. And then any kind of an ion that flows through, whether it's a cation or an anion, will end up attaching itself there. And then we displace H plus and OH minus. So like in this picture where the uh, Na pluses are coming off, if we have an ion exchange resin with H pluses attached, and then we have an anion, ex excuse me, I said anion exchange resin, I meant to say cation exchange resin because these are cations, the H pluses are going to come off. If we have an anion exchange resin, then we're going to be able to attach chlorides and any other kind of anions that might be flowing through our water there and displace these OHs. And then what's going to happen? Well, these guys are going to hook up and make water, just plain old H2O. So that's a way that we can purify water by taking dissolved ions out of the water using ion exchange. And that's how we produce deionized water. At least that's one way of doing it. That's not the way that's actually done in our particular science building, but the old science building over in Crispin, when it used to be the science building, it had a big ion exchange column that we used to get our deionized water for the whole building, for all the sciences. So that's how ion exchange works, and that's how you can use it to soften hard water and alleviate that problem. So this was all about an application of precipitates and um, kind of thinking about ions hooking up with um, other ions, and that's kind of been the theme of this chapter, right? So there you go.